On this week in Enterprise Tech, we are at Interrupt Las Vegas 2015. That's right, folks. It's live. Twyet on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Dropbox for Business. Dropbox for Business lets your team sync and share files just like Dropbox, and you can connect Dropbox for Business with over 300,000 apps for project management. Visit dropbox.com slash business for a free 14-day trial. That's dropbox.com slash business. And by ProFlowers. Mother's Day is May 10th and ProFlowers has got you covered. Get one dozen rainbow roses and a free glass vase for just $19.99 plus shipping. Visit proflowers.com, click the microphone in the top right corner, and enter the code TWIT. Welcome to Twyat This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Ballas here, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. And you may have noticed that we're not in the Twit Brick House. In fact, right now, the three of us are at Interop Las Vegas in, uh, in Nevada. Of course, I'm joined by my stalwart co-host, starting with Mr. Brian Chi, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. Brian, how are you today? Oh, low on energy, Padre. But, you know, Interop is a lot of fun, and I'm learning an awful lot about SDN. Yeah, yeah, we're going to be touching a little bit on that. Uh, SDN has definitely been a trend here at Interop. Speaking of trends and trendsetters, we're also joined by Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, good to see you on this wonderful pre-show morning. Padre, it is great to be here. Las Vegas is the place to be, and Interop is the place to be in Las Vegas. So here we are setting the trend. Yeah. Now, uh, I should note that uh, Interop has given us this nice little build-out. We're actually not in a white room with Johnny Ive. Uh, this <laughs> is a, a, a part of the NOC that has been specifically built out for media presentation. Uh, we're going to work on the walls next time because we, we are a bit white. And it's actually pre-show. This is early, early in the morning on what, what day is this? Uh, it's Wednesday. 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 <laughs> and uh, yeah, the show, the reason why we're doing it now is because we figured it's going to get really noisy in here in a bit. In fact, it's, you're going to start mm. hearing some of the noise come in as we get closer to the open of the floor. But you know what, fellas? Let's go ahead and ignore that and jump in to the blips. This first one comes to us from Nokia. Now, for a while now, rumors have been circulating that Nokia was getting ready to re-enter the mobile phone manufacturing business after selling off its phone division to Microsoft. With their non-compete clause running out in 2016, pundits have enjoyed to no end what a clean slate Nokia mobile might look like. But alas, the Finnish company has officially quashed the rumors, saying in no uncertain terms that Nokia has, quote, no plans to manufacture or sell consumer handsets. EmoSpark may just be the robotic companion you need in the office. Now, EmoSpark is a, an I, AI console that raised uh, almost $180,000 in two months for over on a crowdfunding site. But you know what? It is like Siri, well, on performance-enhancing drugs. Because in addition to listening to your voice, it watches your face, telling you what kind of mood you're in. So it can tell if you're being cynical, if you're angry, if you're happy, and you know it. It may just be the AI to replace that admin you lost in the last wave of cuts. Now, it's not quite ready for prime time, but you know what? It's only about $400 and may just change the way we work in our crowded offices. We've been hearing speculation on Tesla's super battery for some time, but what does it mean for the enterprise? So the low-hanging fruit is residential solar, and Tesla is first targeting a $13,000 battery pack that can potentially keep your home lit up during a power outage, or better yet, take your home off the grid. 
What this means for enterprises is that we might start seeing a new generation of uninterruptible power systems that take advantage of these huge batteries to dramatically reduce the cost to run monster power systems for your data center. This also means that enterprises could also start considering harvesting PV energy covering the roofs and parking lots to charge up these massive batteries and perhaps take their data centers off the grid. Keeping firmly in mind that in many cases, the data center is the number one consumer of energy for many organizations. They've kept saying the world would change if someone comes up with a new power source, and Elon Musk is certainly stepping up to the plate. Well, talking about SDN, HP has made a play for the SDN campus. Strengthening its position in the SDN market, HP has rolled out the 5400R ZL2 Switch V3 module and the HP Network Visualizer SDN app. The module packs a 6th gen AS ASIC customized for SDN, 10 packet processing engines, and programmable open flow pipelines that will give the HP 5400R chassis smart rate ports that can self negotiate between 1G, 2.5G, 5G, and 10G with PoE on top of a 2 terabit backplane. This makes it possible to support the 3.5 gigabits of bandwidth needed for HP's newly acquired Aruba Networks Wave 2 802.11a CAPs or up to 288 ports in a single chassis. The Visualizer app integrates with Microsoft Active Directory and can identify user issues through the SDN without the need to configure the network for additional appliances. These upgrades put HP Solution in direct competition with Cisco's 4507 series chassis with a notable bump in performance and a drop in price. Flight delayed? Blame it on the iPad. Several dozen American Airlines flights were grounded earlier this week when the iPads that their flight crews use to replace those bulky packs of flight manuals went blank. Now, separate replacement iPads were brought on board that solved the problem, but a number of flights were delayed or canceled because, well, those iPads just weren't working. Now, American went with the iPads because they were able to, they say, save 24 million pages of documents carried in bags, and that was 35 pounds each. So they saved about 400,000 gallons of fuel a year. Doesn't do a whole lot of good, though, if you and your blank iPad are left sitting at the gate. It was bound to happen. Google slapped with an age discrimination lawsuit. Face it, we've identified Google with young, hip techies who've been setting the pace in Silicon Valley. However, when Robert Heath was rejected by Google in 2011, even though it was documented as having highly pertinent qualifications and experience, he was still rejected by the tech giant. The sad fact is that more and more organizations are only hiring young kids so they can get many years out of the new hire, but in fact are committing age discrimination. All too often, the AARP generation are being laid off because of budget cuts and are staying unemployed much longer than their younger competitors. Just remember, folks, you can't claim you're an equal employment opportunity to organization if you ignore gray power. Hey, do you want to stop IP trolls in their tracks? Well, sell your patents to Google. IP trolls have all but shattered the patent system in the United States, taking advantage of an overworked government agency, vague patent descriptions, and some rather unscrupulous district courts to make innovation all but impossible without a multi-million dollar legal team. Well, Google has a solution. Sell your patents to them. Google has started a program that they call Patent Purchase Promotion, which creates a limited time marketplace for patent holders to sell their patents to the search giant. They can tell them exactly what they do and how much they're willing to sell them for. Open between May 8th and May 22nd, PPP will inform the owners of desired patents of their interest by June 26th and pay them by late August. It's hoped that the program will keep patent trolls from purchasing weaponizable patents, and since Google has already established themselves as a gatekeeper for fair IP usage, they'd like the defensive ability to encourage the development of new technologies. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. When we come back, we're going to go ahead and jump into some Enterprise Bytes before we jump into interop itself but uh, uh curtis Stewart, what do you think uh, time for maybe an ad yeah, yeah why not ad sounds that. good that's, that's, yeah you know what folks let's go ahead and jump back to the brick house and uh hear about the first sponsor of this week in enterprise tech thank you padre i hope that you chebert and curtis are enjoying interop we're back here in the studio to bring you word of the first sponsor of this episode of this week in enterprise tech and of course it's got to be Dropbox. Now, you've already heard of Dropbox. If you've done any research, 
into the easiest way to sync and share files, well, you know about Dropbox. And more importantly, your employees know about Dropbox. They know that it's the easiest way to get files from point A to point B. Now, even though you know all that, I bet you did know that there's a Dropbox that was specifically designed for business. Dropbox for Business is the better way to manage accounts, manage billing, and most importantly for those of us who have to keep an eye on how data travels in our enterprise, have visibility and control over that data. Dropbox for Business lets you do just that. So, you might be asking yourself, what is Dropbox for Business? Well, it's the same easy-to-use, quick-to-set-up Dropbox that your users and employees already love and trust. That's important because it means that you don't have to train them into a new solution because they already use it. It provides simple storage and sharing for any type of file on any platform and any device. Now, if you're worried about space, well, just don't. Each Dropbox for Business user starts off with one terabyte of space and it's easy to expand. Staff can collaborate with team members and securely invite and control access to outside partners, clients, and vendors. And most importantly for IT professionals, Dropbox for Business has powerful admin controls like remote wipe, intuitive sharing, and permission controls, plus complete audit logs. This way, IT can make sure that only the right people get access to sensitive company data. A Dropbox for Business integrates with third-party security and administration solutions like SIEM, DLP, and eDiscovery for even more control. And last but not least, the robust Dropbox for Business infrastructure uses encryption for file data in transit and at rest, plus segmentation and hashing to anonymize files. Extra security features are available like single sign-on and two-step verification if you need them. Now, you already use Dropbox, as do 4 million businesses. So why look for another solution when you've already got the one that works? You want to give it a try? Well, take advantage of your employer's familiarity with Dropbox and sign up for Dropbox for Business. Visit dropbox.com slash business for a free 14-day trial of Dropbox for Business. That's dropbox.com slash business. And we thank Dropbox for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Back to you, Padre Curtis and Chebert at Interop Las Vegas 2015. Well, thank you, Padre. And uh, we're back here at Interop Las Vegas 2015. Gents, we're done with the blips. Let's go ahead and jump straight in to the bites. Uh, this first one has been lingering for a while. It's all about Microsoft getting ready to write off that Nokia deal, or at least a large part of it. Uh, in its first quarter 2015 earnings, Microsoft made statements that seem to indicate that it's getting ready to cut anchor on that Nokia deal. Now, the specific language is, and I quote, declines in expected future cash flows, reduction in future unit volume growth rates, or an increase in the risk-adjusted discount rate used to estimate the fair value of the phone hardware reporting unit may re result in a determination that an impairment adjustment is required, resulting in a potentially material change to earnings. Now, Curtis, let me throw this to you first because... Uh, you know, you can miss that very easily, but that's legalese for, yeah, we're losing money on this. Oh, ab absolutely. Not only that we're losing money, but uh, that we're losing money in a way that means we might have to go back and make some very specific one-time charges and adjustments that's going to hit our bottom line in a significant way. Right. And, uh, you know, the idea of, of, of the one-time charge, because we hear this every once in a while, whenever a deal goes south or whenever someone acquires a unit and then decides, we don't really want this, we're going to spin it off, is we take the hit now and it won't impact future quarters. Right. Okay. That, that's right. Basically, instead of watching the value of a unit decline and have something of an effect on earnings over a long period of time, we're just going to make that one very painful hit this quarter and um, put a sunny face on things in quarters to come. It's uh, ripping the Band-Aid off rather than <laughs> peeling it off slowly. Now, uh, the language uh, in the actual filing was it's a 10Q, uh, which was filed with the SEC, and it signaled that they're, ma they're planning on taking a massive write-off on its phone hardware division, which, of course, everyone is saying it's got to be Nokia. Now, that amount, somewhere north of $5.46 billion dollars now you remember the deal was 7.9 billion so this is a significant portion of it essentially you're leaving two billion and change uh Chieber, what what do they keep what do they write off well i'll tell you a lot of the cortana technology is definitely going to be sticking around and you know i'll i'll lay even odds that they're going to probably keep in a lot of the voice recognition technology and I think that's probably going to be about the $2 billion in change on the table. Right. And then, of course, the IP. They'll hold on to the IP. Yeah, of course. They've, they've already dumped. I mean, 
some of this is really done because they dumped off the manufacturing capability a while back. They don't they don't really need that. They don't really want that. They right. they want it to be on its own. Now, in the first quarter of 2015, Microsoft Phone Division booked 1.4 billion dollars of revenue, which is you know it's not much, but it's respectable. Unfortunately, the cost of that revenue was higher by $4 million, and that was before R&D, marketing, or any other expenses. So the analysts have estimated that Microsoft spent $1.8 billion to make $1.4 billion. Now, I am not a math savant, but I don't think that's good. Uh, Curtis, this isn't Microsoft getting out of the phone business and the mobile device business. They're, they're in for the long haul. They understand that that's part of their new strategy, which actually was inherited from the old strategy. But this whole idea of resetting the slate, what does it give them? What, what can they do now that they've gotten this bad debt off the table? Well, I think one of the big things that it does, if you look at the way they were selling hardware, uh, one of the things that it's difficult to figure out is just how much they were making on the software on each of those. So if they were spending 12 cents per handset in the hardware side of things, but making $12 on the software side, well, then it worked out well. But what we see here is someone deciding that the hardware, the way they were selling it, was just a little bit too expensive a way to move their software. So what they're going to do is find a, well, less damaging way to move the software when you look at their bottom line. So they're resetting, deciding that you know, Nokia, God bless them, let them rest in peace, but we're not going to count them as part of our hardware anymore. We're moving forward with a clean slate, both from a branding standpoint and from a financial standpoint. And you know, one thing I do want to bring up, uh, at the time of the acquisition, I don't think a lot of people remember, remember this, one of the things a lot of people talked about was the CEO of Nokia and there was some speculation that what Microsoft had done was buy their next CEO and obviously that didn't come to fruition and so I think what we're seeing here is a complete clearing of the decks and resetting of things in every direction on this Nokia buy. Chiba, let me throw this over to you for a bit because it's interesting that Microsoft had this grand strategy when they released Windows 8 of you it's the same interface. Not quite the same OS, but the same interface. You had Windows 8, you had Windows RT, you had Windows Mobile, and that made a nice little trinity of, of things that were supposed to compile the same apps across platforms. Windows RT is gone. Windows, it's been chucked out the window, it's dead, and I'm actually kind of happy that it's dead. Windows Mobile is languishing. It is a distant third place it's a beautiful operating system. Everyone who uses it says, you know, it's really nice, it's really clean, it, it runs on hardware that doesn't have to be super chunky. You, you can talk about days and days of battery life, but there's no apps, at least the apps that people want. And it's, it's such a distant third that it, it might almost be considered not even competing with iOS and Android. So where do they go? I mean, now that they're, they're getting this Nokia chapter out, which you can debate back and forth whether or not it was a good idea, what's left for Microsoft in, in terms of mobile? You know, I'm, it my crystal ball is very cloudy on this, but it does occur to me that, especially the way Android ROMs are architected, I don't see too much of a reason why we can't have some sort of Android ROM shim, you know, a GUI shim on top of the Android kernel. And that kind of makes some sense in the long run, especially since it still allows Microsoft to move those apps. And especially since Microsoft has been pushing some Android solutions recently. And the fact that I think the dream device for most Android fanboys, including myself, would be a Nokia phone with the Nokia camera, but an Android operating system. Yeah. Let's go ahead and move on to the next enterprise bite. And uh, gents, I have a question for you, and that is, when is enough big data enough? Now, uh, this story is out of the EFF. It's, it's, it's in its early days. Now, we are accustomed to talking about the different ways that big data analytics could potentially invade our privacy from, from randomized data sets that don't quite have enough personally identifying information removed to the internet of invasive things, you know, the internet of things that's not well thought out. Xerox has developed an automated pa vehicle passenger detection system that can look into vehicles traveling at highway speeds up to 100 miles an hour 
and determine how many passengers are actually in the cabin. Now, they're selling this as a way to monitor HOV lanes, those, car, those lanes that we have on freeways that, that you can only use in certain times if you have two, three, four passengers in the car. It's, it's all up to the state. Now, they say that they can have up to about a 95 to 98% certainty rate so the, the software is pretty darn good it works by having two cameras one that looks dead on and one that looks to the side of the vehicle and it creates a composite now if you are in violation the system will automatically use your license plate which it got with the front camera and send the information to the chp which well, in california which could then send you a ticket for using the hov lanes when you're not supposed to okay that sounds pretty innocuous this is just a way to, to stop cheaters and we all like stopping cheaters the eff is worried because the cameras are of a high enough resolution that combined with some facial recognition software, you could potentially track everyone as they're whizzing down the freeway at up to 100 miles an hour. Uh, and the only thing that keeps them from doing that right now is the faces are redacted, but that's, that's on, in software. And if the pictures are being stored, you can unredact them and potentially use it as evidence. Curtis, let me throw this to you. It's easy to cry wolf with something like this. And, you know, the EFF, I'm not saying they're crying wolf. They're, they're bringing up a legitimate excuse, but this is a legitimate application. This is a legitimate function. This is a, this is a decent use of technology. Is it too much? Does it become invasive? I think that a lot of people are going to say that it does because in one sense, this is an extension of the kind of debate we're seeing across the country with red light cameras. Um, where it's one thing people have no trouble at all with an officer of the law, a human being who is present, who says, ah, we've caught you doing something bad, you must therefore pay the penalty. People have a great deal more trouble with the idea that there's simply some automated system that is going to do that, be there and decide whether you're, you're in violation or not. And in this case, the fact that the capability to do facial recognition is there means that there is the near certainty that within a short period of time we're going to get uh, the first case where we're told that uh, some notorious criminal was arrested because they were captured in the HOV lane going down I-15 and uh, a, a platoon of state troopers was waiting for them at the next exit. It's, it's inevitable. Uh, so this is a slope that's big, steep, slippery, and uh, may just be uh, a couple of black diamonds too rich for most people's blood. Right. Now they're going to try the system down in San Diego, uh, and uh, I mean, they've already got permission to deploy it, so this it's a test case, so we'll see what happens. But Chebert, I, I want to pick up on something that, that Curtis said, that we're, we're okay with humans doing this. And it, I did, that is a very strange thing because humans will make mistakes far more than an automated system. But we feel better. Is that it? Is that all this comes down to? We just feel better? I'm, I'm actually going to blame this on 2001 and open the pod bay doors, Hal. <laughs> You know, ever since we started hearing about this in horror movies and science fiction and so forth, um, people have raised that question. Can we really trust an artificial intelligence because it's not working in the best interest of the human race, or so we say? Uh, I also noticed something else in the story, that it works up to about 100 miles an hour. Maybe it means we got to go more than 100 <laughs> miles an hour. So when you get pulled over, officer, I'm just trying to protect my personal liberties. You bet. All right. I like this. this and remember, Chebert... Chebert does say you have permission to travel at 120 oh, miles gee, an hour. Oh, gee, thanks, Marjorie. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you know, something else I do want to draw out of this, because this was, this was another interesting point that you brought up, Curtis, um, and uh, it's that slippery slope. It's odd that we want humans in the loop at the beginning, but we don't want them in the loop at the end. And that's, that's the fear, that somehow these photos are going to get misused by a law enforcement agency. As you said, someone there's going to be some high profile case and we're all going to agree oh that was a good use of the technology you caught that child molester you caught that mass murderer because of these cameras but it also means well they're storing everyone's image everyone's information and it means that no matter even if you're doing absolutely nothing 
there is the cold calculating computer doing big data analytics saying, well, I know exactly where this person has been because I picked him up on 15 different cameras in the Bay Area and I know where he was at what time. And it, that's not illegal, but it does seem creepy, right? Oh, it's very creepy. And it, and it brings up the two sides of this because you will have some people uh, who say, well, if you're not doing anything wrong, <laughs> you shouldn't have to worry oh, about it. I hate that. But then the, the other side, and this is the side that, that I tend to come down on, is that if you're not doing anything wrong, it's none of the government's damn business. And I think that uh, this is a debate we are having um, in spotty ways here in the U.S. on a case-by-case basis. And in many ways, we're looking across the pond at, say, the prevalence of surveillance cameras in uh, the United Kingdom and trying to decide if we want that here because we do have uh, you know, a different basis in law, a different tradition. Uh, it's, it's good that we are having the debate. Um, it's sad that we have to. Well, gentlemen, let's move to something that's not sad, and specifically, let's talk a little bit about Interop. So we're at Interop right now, and again, you can probably hear a little bit of machine noise behind us because they always move the heavy stuff before the show starts. Let's do Interop by the numbers. So this is a five-day conference. It started last week uh, with classes. Uh, It's the 29th year of the annual running of the IT Geeks, uh, but it's the 25th year of Interop. Uh, I I know most of you have heard our explanation of how Interop came to be. Chiebert, Cafe in Monterey, a bunch of engineers in the Bay Area who decide this is stupid that our equipment can't talk to each other. So they, they come out, they show their code to engineers they're not supposed to show code to because it's proprietary company secrets. And they said, well, if you change this and I change this, we can interoperate. And that's the start of Interop. You bet. This conference has 12,000 attendees this year. It has 300 exhibitors, which includes 125 new exhibitors, which we like to see because it means that you're, you're getting new entry, new blood into the market. It's got 10 conference tracks covering applications, collaboration, cloud, infosec, leadership, mobility, infrastructure, storage, virtualization, and SDN. And that SDN is actually huge. It's 125 conference sessions, 26 workshops, and you get keynote addresses from executives of Google, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Adobe, Cisco, even the Boston Red Sox, who have uh, their own take on big data analytics and you know how you use it to drive an enterprise. But I want to specifically talk about trends. And in that trend, the number one thing that I, I noticed this year is SDN. Now, Curtis, four years ago, SDN was an experiment. It was something here at iLabs. We were showing people what it was. We had a bunch of folks from Stanford who came in. We borrowed, begged, and stole hardware from different manufacturers that we thought would work. And uh, we put together an iLabs. Three years ago, SDN was a curiosity. It was past the lab, but it was something like, it could be interesting, but my network works just fine. Two years ago, SDN became a promising technology. People started saying, oh, you could do some interesting things with this, even though we're not doing it right now. Last year, SDN became a must-have. If you didn't have SDN capabilities in your new switch, there was no reason to buy it. This year, I think we finally figured out how to usefully implement SDN. And uh, Chibert, let's talk a little bit about the Interop network. HP is doing all of our core, and they're using, using SDN across the different colos that we have. So we have colos in Denver, in uh, the Bay Area, and in New York. Previously, we had used an old routing scheme so that if one colo went down, another colo would pick up its place. But there's a topo in front of the knock right now that shows all the things that we can do now that we've actually got a fully SDN-capable network where everything just gets reorganized on the fly. Well, you know, SDN is all about flexibility and being able to make fairly sweeping changes quickly and very easily it is kind of what everybody wanted vlans to be able to do but vlans were cumbersome uh you started doing a lot of q and q and things like that and it would just eat the cpus on your switch well sdn and decoupling of the control plane from the data plane makes a heck of a difference and it allows you to scale up your infrastructure very very quickly very very well I'm not going to say easily, but easier, and gives you a le- level of flexibility to meet the issues that things like BYOB introduce into your enterprise. 
Now, Curtis, one of the things that the decoupling of the control plane from the switch was supposed to do for us is it was supposed to make boxes a commodity. It didn't matter who you bought your switches from because if, as long as they were SD incompatible, you separated out the control plane, you used the controller that you wanted, you used the control scheme that you wanted, and the boxes just became dumb boxes. That hasn't really happened. And, and I, I think that's, that's absolutely predictable because, of course, no vendor here wants to become just the dumb box that you run your own flavor of, of SDN on. So HP has a flavor of, of SDN. Cisco has a flavor of SDN. VMware is promoting a particular flavor of SDN. That's not going to go away anytime soon, is it? Probably not within the next 12 months. I, when I talk to some of the experts here, they're predicting that somewhere probably in the next 24 to 36 months, we'll see some genuine interoperability out there as some of the standards become more solidified as they move further along the standard making process and more of the vendors uh, basically decide that they have no choice but to follow them. You know, we, we've already had uh, a case of one major vendor, Cisco, declaring that the, uh, the SDN war was over and they won and everyone else should just go home. Uh, everyone else did not just go home. Uh, but, uh, but you're absolutely right. The discussion this year has been not around will SDN work, but really what use cases are the best for SDN. So we're getting people talking about whether it is just a technology that's of interest to the very large ISPs, cloud companies, and the largest enterprises, or whether it has application down in smaller companies and smaller enterprises. That's a, a real change, and I think that shows an important development in the maturity of the entire set of technologies. It means that people are getting serious about thinking and planning on how they're going to deploy SDN when, when they finally get around to doing that. Well, gents, I'm going to ask for some more of your observations about Interop in just a bit. But first, let's go ahead and uh, jump back over to the studio where I think there's this really handsome guy just waiting to tell us about the second sponsor of this week of this week in Enterprise Tech. Thanks again, Padre, Chibert, and Curtis. I hope that Interop Las Vegas 2015 is going well for you. I know it's going well over here because I get to talk about the second sponsor for this week in Enterprise Tech. Now, look, I know you pretty well, and I know that you're all grizzled IT folk. I know that you've seen blood and guts and data and servers. I know that you do things like spin up virtual machines only just before they're needed, that you memorize all the IP addresses of your servers, even IPv6. But sometimes, just sometimes, you need to show that more sensitive side. Sometimes you need to show the people that you care about that you love them. And that's why we've got your back covered with Pro Flowers. A Mother's Day is coming up on Sunday, May 10th, and it will be here before you know it. You know that your mom or all the moms in your life deserve a little bit of recognition. Appreciating your mom this Mother's Day doesn't have to be stressful. Pro Flowers makes buying a beautiful gift for your mom simple and quick. And they've got everything that you need for Mother's Day for all the moms in your life. You choose the delivery date that you want, and it's guaranteed. It's not going to arrive the day before or the day after. It's going to arrive on the day that they say it's going to arrive. And best of all, their flowers are guaranteed to be fresh and beautiful for at least seven days after you receive them. Now, using Pro Flowers is easy. They offer a wide range of beautiful flowers starting at just $19.99 plus shipping. They have flowers for all occasions, including roses, daisies, tulips, orchids, lilies, and more. Now, if you don't know what all of that means, you don't have to. That's why you've got Pro Flowers. Their experts help you choose exactly the arrangements that you need. And every order comes with the Pro Flowers guarantee. Uh, for Mother's Day, Pro Flowers has a special offer for fans of Twit. Get one dozen rainbow roses in a free glass vase for only $19.99 plus shipping. Or you can upgrade to two dozen in a free glass vase for just $9.99 more. Visit proflowers.com today. Click the blue microphone in the top right corner and be sure to enter the code TWIT. But you only have until Friday, May 8th to take advantage of this special offer. And if you order by then, you can still get guaranteed delivery for Mother's Day. That's proflowers.com and use the code TWIT, T-W-I-T. We thank ProFlowers for their support and on behalf of TWIT to all mothers out there, happy Mother's Day. Now back to you at the conference, Padre Chebert and Curtis. 
Well, thank you, Padre. And uh, yeah, it's it's great to be back here at Interop Las Vegas 2015. Now, gentlemen, we have been working on a little something, something. We wanted to give people a behind the scenes tour of, of what goes on here at Interop. Now, last year when we did live from Interop 2014, we showed them some of the infrastructure. We showed them a lot of the, the, the basement and you know the distribution closet. I thought maybe this time we want to might want to actually talk to some of the engineers who helped to put this thing together. So uh, what do you say? Shall we show them a little something something? You bet. Sounds like a plan. This is for you. Hi, I'm Glenn Evans, lead engineer for the InteropNet project. The InteropNet is the networking engine that drives the Interop event. We provide connectivity to all the exhibitors and attendees at Interop. And what we have now are a couple of our team leads who can explain some of the features and functionality of the InteropNet. We've had HP in the InteropNet for quite a few years. They are the power behind our data centers. I'm standing next to Jeff Enters, who has well, worked with us for years and years and years, to explain what HP has done this year. Now, Jeff, SDN is all the rage here at Interop. Every vendor has to have SDN. It's no longer an option. And SDN has really changed the way that we build the Interop net because it, it's given us more options. Can you talk a little bit about this? This is the topo that shows how the Interop net works. And you'll notice that, well, we're doing an entirely different management schema. What did you do? Sure, thanks Padre, appreciate it. Good being here. So Jeff Fenters with HP Technology Services Organization. So yeah, we've been part of InteropNet for about eight years now. We've, uh, over time, we've taken over a little bit more and more of the responsibilities within the data centers. So you have switch and route up there and IPS is as Padre was mentioning. Uh, but now we started introducing SDN. And so while it wasn't a wholesale change from a networking standpoint, right, we couldn't just change up the existing topology. We need to look at ways that we could surgically uh, deploy SDN in areas just where we needed them. So that's what was a little bit unique with the solution that we have here. You'll, you'll see up on the topology map up there that there's some of the switches up there that are blue. Those are the ones that we've enabled open flow on them, and we've not just enabled open flow across the entire switch. We may have only enabled it on one port, one single VLAN that's attached to one port in certain areas. So we, we're very careful about where we enable it, but it's giving us new options that we haven't had before. We haven't been able to do DNS inspection at the access layer of the network, right? In our DMZ zones up there, we've got 20 different vendors deploying VLANs. Who knows when, who knows where, how do we protect against that? We're now, with our latest application coming out, we're going to be able to do packet tracing or tapping anywhere we want within that network without having to, you know, monitor port, mirror port, we took something, right? No, none of that anymore. We'll be able to very easily just say, we need these IPs, we need this port, and very easily stream it back to anywhere we want. So it's just, it's, it's a it's beginning foundation of providing things that we haven't been able to do with traditional networking. It's an exciting time for us because we've been talking about the promise of SDN for quite some time, but now we're actually starting to see how it's going to change the way we develop our networks. Now, Jeff, if they want to find out more about HP, where do they go? You got to go to hp.com slash networking. Find out a little bit more, hp.com slash SDN if you want to hit right to the SDN page. Thank you. One of the more interesting stories from the Interop Net is the fact that though we have a lot of Cisco gear in the core and in distribution on the show floor, those switches didn't actually come from Cisco. They came from a company called Curvature. With me is Chris Cruteau from Curvature who's going to explain what the company does. Chris, how are you supporting the Interop Net? Well, here we have brought a number of different pieces of Cisco equipment, but to start out, Curvature is one of the leading providers in the secondary market for Cisco equipment and for other vendors. We're not affiliated with Cisco, we're not affiliated with the Cisco channel, so that gives us a huge amount of flexibility in what we can offer, and you'll see that with what we've brought. So for the Internet Edge, we have brought Cisco's ASR1002 series router. It's their current production router, and it's suitable for anything from the one to 100 gigabits worth of total throughput. As we only have a gigabit connection, we have the smallest, route, smallest model here. At the network core, 
We have brought the, the uh, Cisco Catalyst 6506E with the previous generation VSS 720 supervisor and line cards. While it's only got 40 gigabits per slot of throughput, we have found that for the interop net, that throughput fits our needs remarkably well. And as an older generation stable platform, it's provided us the reliability you expect out of the internet core. On the show floor, we once again have the older generation Catalyst 3750X series switches with PoE Plus and 10 gig uplinks. Uh, unlike the Catalyst 3850, which is still very new and still in active development, the 3750X is an older platform, very few bugs, and a very, very reliable access layer switch, hence why we chose it for the show floor. Uh, Chris, I, I got to ask, there's going to be people out there, because our audience is very tech savvy, they're all in IT, they all do this for a living, they're going to say, wait a minute, you're telling me I want to buy used equipment? I mean, yeah, I understand that used equipment is less expensive, but but why would I want to do that? Why wouldn't I want to go to Cisco and get a contract from them? What what is typically your elevator pitch when you when you try to convince people that hey, this is what you want, this is the price you want to pay, and this is all the latest and greatest stuff that they they might be releasing? Right. I think the biggest the biggest thing to keep in mind is yeah, sure, curvature. We are going to be less expensive than Cisco in the Cisco channel because of our how we source equipment, but I think the real benefits to using us over the Cisco channel is, number one, our testing capability. Every piece of equipment that leaves our warehouse has been tested. All the ports have been tested, all the equipment has been tested against our Spirant test center, so we get line rate, per line rate performance out of it, as well as loading up the control plane. We run BGP, OSPF to ensure that the CPU is at 100% and the memory is full. In addition to that, we also offer our own service, you know, offer our own maintenance. So if you do want to deploy legacy equipment that Cisco may not even be providing support on, you can get the support contract through us. We'll maintain it for you. We'll sell it to you. And finally, outside of Cisco, we have a very strong team of engineers. And we're going to suggest whatever solution works for you, for your environment, whether that be current production or legacy. All right, and if they want to find out more about Curvature, what you're doing here at the InteropNet, where can they go? www.curvature.com. Wireless at Interop this year is, well, unique because we've got the vendor that has released the very first commercially available Wave 2 802.11 AC access point. I'm here with GT Hill from Ruckus who's going to explain what they've done with their brand new APs. GT, thank you very much for talking to us. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me here. Now, this is what I've seen before. I've played with the 600 series, very nice device, 802.11 AC very nice and fast, but of course, the buzz around the industry has been about the release of Wave 2 802.11ac. Tell me a little bit about the way you spec it, because I know a few things are unique about the way you built out your hardware. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, number one, this is the first also 4x4, four four, four stream access point out there, uh, which is actually not inherent to 11ac Wave 2, but is definitely an awesome improvement. So Wave 2, with Wave 2 comes multi-user MIMO, Multi-user MIMO is kind of like the thing that makes it Wave 2. The ability for this access point to be able to transmit to multiple client devices simultaneously. Client support's already hitting the market, which is awesome. But this one also has Bluetooth built in. So it actually has a USB port for Bluetooth uh, low energy. Location is becoming a huge deal, so that's also important to it. Uh, one of the things that we're starting to see with these releases of, a of Wave 2 devices is every manufacturer picks their special sauce, because the 802.11ac spec itself leaves a lot of wiggle room based on what you think would be best for your customer. How have you optimized your 700 series? Yeah, the R710 is um, optimized, number one, it has our BeamFlex technology. That's what Ruckus is known for. It's got the awesome antenna system. This one actually has four antenna systems that are both dual band, um, about 4,000 different unique patterns polarization diversity, which means the signals can go up and down or side to side. So if you do something crazy like take your mobile phone and start watching it landscape, you're not going to get any blips, you're not going to get any losses. Uh, of course, this has link aggregation, so if you want to bind two ports together, which interestingly enough, we actually don't think many people will need to do. Uh, there's a whole different discussion on that, but uh, you can approach two gigabits if you need to on the Ethernet side. But uh, this one also is powered by 802.3 AF, 
So you don't need to upgrade your switches either to greater than gigabit, and you don't have to upgrade them from a power perspective. So made this super efficient on that side. Actually, that, that is a, it's a very good point. Let's talk a little bit about that because we've got members in our audience right now who are saying, well, oh, maybe I've got 802.11ac, the first wave deployed throughout my network. I'm wary about wave two because I don't want to have to replace everything, I pull out all my switches, do a forklift upgrade so I can get 3.5 or 5 gig to my APs. You've gone a different route than just trying to bond everything and give the largest the, the largest capacity possible. Uh, can, can you talk a little bit about the, the, the strategy of doing that? Yes, absolutely. The Number one, let's talk power. So th there's two real components. Why do you change out your switch network? One is how much PoE power does it take? We were the first ones with the R700 to be able to run fully operational with AF. The R710 uh, has an AF mode. Um, it drops off the USB support and one Ethernet port. But as far as performance, full throughput, it still maintains that on AF. So let's talk about the other side. I get a lot of questions, just like I had in a, in a symposium today. They said, do I have to drop two cables to every access point now? The answer is, in every test that we run, the answer is no. Now, there are particular environments. If someone says, I'm heavy graphics, I've got the, the future four stream MacBook Pros, maybe I could see that. But truthfully speaking, with the mobile devices that we're looking at today, exceeding Ethernet, which is, of course, full duplex, with a half duplex technology like Wi-Fi, especially since all of us are uploading a lot of tweets, a lot of images, um, since we're all doing that, there's no real reason to upgrade. Again, um, we would love to upgrade people, and I'm sure everyone else would out there too, on the switch side, but the truth is you just don't really need it. Um, so what we designed this to be swap it out with whatever you have today and not have to do anything with your switches. If you are at Interop, you've already used Ruckus because they're powering the Interop net. But if they're not here, because of course they're not because they're watching the show later on, where can they go to find out more information about the 600, about the 710, and about Ruckus in general? Obviously, you can just uh, hit us up on ruckuswireless.com or any of the social media outlets. We're on there uh, quite a lot. And uh, you can always reach out directly to me. I'm more than happy to, uh, to take inquiries as well. Hi, it's Aaron Rollo, founder and CEO of TSO Logic, along with our CTO, Chris Tivill. TSO Logic has been part of Interop.net and the SDN Lab for the last two years, and we're intently focused on identifying and improving the IT efficiency levels of data centers in a way that business owners can understand it. We've been working now across the last two years with Interop to identify how efficient the network is to improve on that efficiency, and also to keep track of the number of connected users and the amount of compute and network that's required to deliver the show. What we've been able to find is that this year, at our busiest time, which was about 2.30 in the afternoon, we had about 1,900 users connected into the wireless network. And that's about a 16% improvement over the busiest time that the show had last year. So in short, we're about 16% busier than the previous year. When we project that out to tomorrow, we identify that tomorrow will be the busier of the days based on last year's activity, and we're going to peak out at about 2,300 users connected to the network right around 11 a.m. That helps the data center team plan for performance and utilization levels. It also helps the businesses plan for when they should have more staff in their booths and more people available on the trade show floor. Connecting the IT back to the business just makes sense for everybody. Aaron Rollo with TSO Logic, if you want more information, www.tsologic.com. Thank you. When you're building out one of the most advanced temporary networks in the world, you have to be worried about power, which is why the Interop Net is powered by CyberPower. I'm here with Dorian Harrow from CyberPower, who's going to explain what CyberPower is doing in the Interop Net. Dorian, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Now, CyberPower, of course, provides power solutions. Everything from backup to conditioning, one phase, three phase. Tell me, 
what is your secret sauce? What is the thing that if someone were to come to you and say, we're looking at building out a data center, a data closet, a, a in bottom of rack system, what is it that you say, this is what we do better than everybody else? Well, I think one of the things that really sets us apart is being able to work directly with the customer and assessing really what their power needs are. We'll do a full power audit, work with them, figure out what their real requirements are, what their run times are. We'll work with them to provide a good solution that'll fit their needs, fit their budget, and be able to deliver within their schedule. Well, and that's one of the things that we've heard about a lot here at Interop, which is this idea of selling solutions rather than just selling products. But let's talk about the products. What do you offer, what's the capacity, and what are we looking for for price points? Right, so for example, here at InteropNet, we've got over 70 kVA of power protection installed. We have UPS units ranging anywhere from entry level 300 VA all the way up to 10,000 VA. And the price points are going to be typically 10, 20 to 40 percent below the competitors. Uh, so that's something that we really uh, pride ourselves on. We have a full three-year warranty on our systems that includes the batteries. That's something that uh, competitors are just uh, coming up with. So that's, those are some of the things that, that really pride ourselves on. Oh, another thing that I like about CyberPower is the combination, the integration of the power system and a really solid management system. Can you talk to me about the, the philosophy that CyberPower has for as, as far as, as being able to have singular control of in racks, in aisles, in devices? Right, so CyberPower has our uh, Power Panel Business Edition software which comes with all of our UPS systems. Uh, there's different kinds of installations that you can do. Our central management software will allow you to view all of your network power within one screen and from there be able to jump to the specific areas that you need to be able to manage and monitor directly and see the nitty gritty details of voltage fluctuations, changing loads, and just battery status in real time so that you're able to manage and know where your problem problems are. Thank you very much for talking to us. Now, if they wanted to find out more about CyberPower, about your solutions, about what they can use from your inventory in their projects, where do they go? They go to www.cpsww.com or just cyberpowersystems.com and we'll be able to help you with what you need. got something out of that little snippet of what happens on the Interop net. Hopefully we'll see you on the expo floor. If you've got any questions, please come up and see us. Now, our goal is to help you, the attendee, get something out of Interop net, whether it's on-site or off-site, we're here to help. Well, that's what we've been doing the last couple of days, and those are the people who have been guiding along our efforts. There is a lot of interesting tech here at the InteropNet, but, gents, it's also about the larger conference. Uh, what are some of the things that you've seen that have impressed you? Curtis, let's start with, start with you. Well, you know, we've been talking about SDN, and there are some things that are evergreens, as you say, infrastructure, security, and all that, but one of the things that I've seen this year are an awful lot of companies out with products that monitor what's going on on the network and report back from various points, including an emphasis on what the end user is experiencing. Basically, these want to tell the network admins, the network managers, what's going on out at the end point and give them a heads up so that their first signal that there's a problem isn't this uh, series of angry phone calls coming in from people who can't reach critical applications. And actually, Cheever, you've been uh, representing a company that, that does a, a lot of that, at Path, which is also an InteropNet sponsor. You bet, Path Solutions. I've actually been talking in the booth about the Aloha Cable Observatory, the world's deepest underwater observatory. But, you know, there was another really cool thing that I saw on the show floor. You know, back when I was, you know, working for a three-letter agency, I had a communications van. It was kind of vanilla. This thing is cool. I but the Sienna <laughs> uh, mobile se uh, central office is spanky. It, isn't that something that we've always wanted to do, right? Just load up a van or an RV 
with all the tech that you need, and then you can drive it from show to show. Oh, yeah. And these things have <laughs> pop-outs and pop-ups. This is a two-story central office. They have meeting rooms in the top. It's like, wow, that, I I love it. You know, park it on, you know, go to shows, park it on the show floor, and that way it can yeah, work. They're, they're, they're mobile booth, studio. Their booth is their RV. Yeah. I lo I love, but, okay, there is, one, there is one problem with that, and that is you don't want the transportation to outshine your technology oh yeah so yeah there's there's but that. no no we got a serious case of geek lust yeah, going we do. on we do no uh, question it, uh, maybe it's maybe like is it universal as you get older you just think about buying an rv it, I, <laughs> right b believe me i i live in florida i, I understand completely. i don't know what that is like when i was a kid i was like oh, that's the stupidest thing ever and i'm like <laughs> that'd be kind of cool load up everything i need and just go just, just hey get, Twiet Roadshow. Twiet Roadshow. So maybe, actually, maybe we could borrow the RV from Sienna. There, you, there you go. Yeah, that, that would be awesome. Uh, you know, uh, one of the other things that I've seen is, and this is this is not, I think it's going to be much bigger next year, but Docker fever has also hit Interop. Every, well, uh, not every, but a lot of the big vendors here in subtle ways are, are saying either our hardware is Docker compatible or we're building in Docker support. And the one I'm, th I'm thinking of, and I, I brought them up before, is Synology. Synology is here, and uh, their guys are great because they, they're, you know, they're saying, oh yeah, look how easy it is to run Docker on our OS. Not only that, they're saying, yeah, we, we like this idea of hybrid cloud, and we like this idea of combining SMB, Soho, mid-range hardware along with enterprise class hardware so you get hybrid within the premise. Uh, what, what else have you seen, Jibber? Oh, no, no, no. Synology, they've got that tiny little Yeah, the NES. DS414 Slim. And, the, you know, while they, they're not, I don't think they're publicly saying it, but we know it can run Docker. Yeah, yeah. So Do that, I Docker think, in your pocket. I think that's going to be my new travel machine. Uh, they sent me one. Oh, oh, I hate you. <laughs> and, and actually, SanDisk is sending me four uh, terabyte SSDs to put in there. Oh, I'm going to have to go and visit <laughs> SanDisk. <laughs> yes. Uh, actually, SanDisk, uh, I didn't know this. I, I don't know when it happened, but they bought IO Fusion, which they was a Waz's company. Right. Which, was it Interop? I think they debuted at Interop like 10 years ago? Yeah, I it think was, so. It was a right. while back. Yeah, it was. We were, uh, the knock was on the other side of the floor back then. But, uh, yeah, it, ridiculously fast storage arrays. Um, I think Sandus. Uh, I'm not sure if Violin is here, but yeah, th there's a few of those on the floor. And uh, I'll tell you one other thing that that to me indicates the the growing presence of Docker is in the last week or so I've seen a number of articles out in the general press starting to poke at the security yeah. of Docker, and that that's I think now one of those inevitable stages of technology development. You you get the initial excitement, you get the the people rolling out. And then you get the people starting to poke at the security. So, so we've reached that level of Docker awareness. But that's part of the maturity. That's part of growing up, right? It's it's now a big enough mass where people are saying, well, before it gets any bigger, you got to fix this, this, and this. Right. Uh, and you know, the big boys are probably starting to go. Mm. Especially since they've spent so much pushing VM. Right. You know, you, everything's VM. VM everything. And now some, there's a player that just said, said no, nope, I'm going to bypass all that. <laughs> and it's cheap, and you can use it for free. <laughs> right. Well, and you know, I, what I keep saying over and over and over again, users don't care about the foundation. They want their apps to run. They want to concentrate on business. And this is something we, we you know, we're, we're like blackbirds. We like sparkly and so forth. And geeks love cool stuff. Yeah. But we we got to make sure we don't lose our focus it's all about applications well gents uh we're gonna call a close to this episode here at interrupt but we do have a lot of content in the can that we're going to be bringing to the folks over the next couple of weeks so we've done a, a several interviews at booths talking to the people at synology at sandisk at dell uh, and uh, we we want you to have all the information that we got from interrupt 2015 any last words before we send them on their way? Well, I would just let everybody know that Interop, of course, is the event here, but Interop is continuing. We did Interop Radio every week coming up before Interop. We're going to continue. So Interop Radio will continue to happen every week going forward. There are going to be some, um, well, we'll call them theme weeks, some, some special things going on 
across the next few months to bring the Interop community together online, everything getting ready for another great Interop um, in just about 12 months. Fantastic. Well, folks, you've done it. You've wasted another hour listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. That's according to nine out of 10 Interop engineers. Of course, I want to thank my panel, my uh, co-hosts, my esteemed friends who, well, I wouldn't want to do twice without them. Let's start with you first, Curtis, because we always start with Chiebert, and that's just not fair. And we've got to mix <laughs> things up. Uh, now, of course, you're on Information Week Radio. They're going to find you here covering Interop. They're going to find you covering Interop after Interop. But where else can they go to find you and your work? Well, I would say the, the best ways to find me are to, to head over to informationweek.com. You'll find links to most of what I do. You'll find articles that I write. You'll also find uh, all of our radio shows right there on informationweek.com. We'd love to have you there. What about you, Chibert? I know that you need a lot more caffeine in you, uh, but uh, when you're fully caffeinated, where can they find you? Well, after interrupt, I plan on hibernating. But... After I finally met, catch up on my sleep, I've got a whole bunch of papers and grants to write, but I'll be sure to answer your questions and queries at Twitter. I'm at ADVNetLab, A-D-V-N-E-T-L-A-B, and look forward to also having you read my articles at InfoWorld. Gentlemen, it's always a pleasure, and it's always a pleasure to be here at Interop. Uh, that's going to conclude our live episode, but before we go, we want to say a few thanks First of all, we're, we're going to thank Lisa and Leo, of course, because you know, they allow us to keep doing This Week in Enterprise Tech. Our super uh, uh, producer, Karsten, uh, normally my TD, which today that would be me because I'm going to have to edit this the show together off these little GoPros and mishmash of cameras. But most of all, I want to thank you. That's right, the person who comes back each and every single week to watch This Week in Enterprise Tech. Don't forget that you can always go to our show page at twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll be able to get our back episodes, look at our show notes, and subscribe so you can get the show downloaded automatically into your device of choice. Also, don't forget that we do this show live every Friday. Well, not this week, so I probably shouldn't say. Most Fridays we do it live, <laughs> 1 o'clock p.m. Pacific time. Just go to live.twit.tv. You can also jump into our chat room at irc.twit.tv and talk to us when we are doing a live show. It's a nice way that we have to interact with our audience. Uh, finally, I want to uh, well, I want to thank the the folks here at UBM, uh, Interop, for allowing us this space. We've been doing this for years and years and years. It's always fun. It is Geek Summer Camp for us. It's a time for us to to meet old friends, see some new tech, and just reminisce. And uh, well, we love you. Big hugs. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballaser, the Digital Jesuit. Just reminding you that if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Yeah.